So we've talked quite a bit about different types of transforms. We've mentioned several now, the Laplace transform, the Z transform, the Fourier transform. So why do we want to use transforms? And there's a, a few different reasons. One reason is that transforms often simplify difficult math. The classic example there is that everybody really doesn't like doing convolution. The convolution integral isn't horrible, but it's definitely a little tedious to work out. So instead of having to do convolution in the time domain, if we can take the transform, the Fourier transform of a convolution equation, convolution in time turns into multiplication in the frequency domain. So we can avoid doing convolution if we can just compute the transform of the equation, and then we can just resort to doing normal multiplication. So that's a really simple and straightforward example of why we like transforms. We can avoid having to do convolution. Another example is when dealing with differential equations. There are lots of different ways to solve differential equations. If you've taken a class on that, you learned about a whole different bunch of ways. If we can take the Laplace transform of a differential equation, then we can essentially solve the differential equation using just simple algebra, finding roots of polynomials. So in that case, using a transform, the Laplace transform, makes solving a differential equation very simple. So transforms in general just help us out with math sometimes. They're kind of a tool that we can use and apply as necessary to help ourselves out with difficult math. Another important reason to use transforms is that they can provide information about a signal or a system that isn't obvious in the original domain. For example, if you're given a signal in the time domain, you might want to know what the frequency content of that signal is. Depending on the signal, that might be easy or not easy to tell from the time domain. If it's not easy to tell in the time domain, you're given a signal and you have no idea what the frequency content is, well, by taking the Fourier transform of that signal and looking at it in the frequency domain, you can then very easily tell what frequencies are present. Same type of thing for systems. If you're given the impulse response of a system, which is a time domain quantity, and you're asked, how does that system impact signals at a frequency of a kilohertz? Well, that might not be very obvious if you just have the impulse response of the system. However, if you can transform that impulse response into the frequency domain to get the frequency response of the system, then it's very simple to know how that system impacts signals at a kilohertz or any other frequency for that matter. So sometimes transforms can give us insight into quantities that weren't obvious in the original domain. So going from the time domain to the frequency domain, for example, the frequency content of a signal, the frequency response of a system become much more obvious. And another thing just to keep in mind, which kind of goes back to this first point, this final point is that transforms don't always have to make sense. They just need to be useful. So the Fourier transform has a very physical, real interpretation. What frequencies does this signal contain? That makes sense. The S transform, the Laplace transform of a signal, that's a little bit more obscure, a little harder to wrap your head around, but it's a very useful transform. We can use it to solve differential equations. So sometimes the things that we do in this class, you might be wondering, you know, what does this mean? Well, sometimes they don't have to mean anything. That just has to be a useful technique, a useful tool in our toolbox to solve and do, do mathematics. So don't, don't worry about things making sense all the time. The fact that they are useful and let us get around difficult mathematics is sometimes a big reason why we do certain things. So before we start talking about transforms specifically, let's just do a little bit of review of frequency domain variables. There are two ways that we talk about frequency typically. We talk about linear frequencies, and we use the notation F for that. Linear frequencies have units of hertz, or cycles per second. The other useful way to talk about frequency is in terms of radial frequency. And for that, we use the variable omega. And radial frequency and linear frequency have a very simple relationship. The radial frequency is just equal to 2 pi times the linear frequency. So if you know f, you can compute omega. And if you know omega, you can easily compute f. The units of radial frequency are radians per second, because we've taken something that was a per second quantity and multiplied it by 2 pi radians. Also, some things to keep in mind when dealing with periodic signals. Periodic signals have a period. The period we denote capital T. So if a signal is periodic with period T, that means it repeats exactly every capital T units of time. 
If its period is t, then its fundamental frequency, which we denote f0, is equal to 1 over t. So if you have a signal whose period is half a second, 1 over a half is 2, so its fundamental frequency would be 2 hertz. We can convert 2 hertz to radio frequency if we want. So we could compute omega naught is equal to 2 pi f naught, or if we want to replace f naught with what it's equal to, 1 over capital T, we can write the fundamental frequency in terms of radio frequency as 2 pi over t. Another thing to briefly review is the idea of complex numbers. Many of the transforms that we deal with take real valued signals, they'll take like a signal like x of t or x of k, and they'll transform it into a complex valued function. So let's just briefly talk about complex numbers for just a second. There are two ways that we typically write down complex numbers. We can write them down in what's called rectangular form. So when we write down a complex number in rectangular form, we write it like this. Z equals A plus J times B, where J is the square root of negative 1. With the complex number Z defined like this, we call A the real part of the complex number Z, and B is the imaginary part of the complex number Z. So sometimes we'll use this notation like this, A is the real part of Z, B is the imaginary part of Z. In rectangular form like this, we can think of the point Z as the point in the complex plane with real part A and imaginary part B. Another way that we often write down complex numbers is in polar form. So in polar form, we write down a complex number, but we write it down in terms of its magnitude, R, and its angle, theta. So in polar form, we also have two quantities. We have the quantity r and the quantity theta, but we write it in a magnitude and angle format. If we plotted z in polar form in this figure, the distance from the origin is what we denote r, and the angle that the complex number makes is what we denote theta. So these are two common ways that we write down complex numbers, and the way that you visualize it in the complex plane is given by this little plot right here. We often take conjugates of complex numbers. All a conjugate does is change the sign of complex values. So if we take the conjugate of z, and z is in rectangular form, all we have to do is find the j's and change them to negative j's. And if there were any negative j's, we'd change them to positive j's. So all the conjugate operation does is flip the sign of the j's. We can do something very similar for the polar form. So the polar form, if we took the conjugate of z, we would just find the j's and change the j to negative j. So we've taken the conjugate here in the polar form. Another thing we have to do often is take the magnitude of complex quantities. For instance, when we compute the Fourier transform of a signal and we want to look at its amplitude spectrum, the amplitude spectrum is the magnitude of the Fourier transform. So understanding how to take the magnitude of complex quantities is very important. And the easiest way to remember this is just by taking the square root of a complex quantity times its conjugate. So no matter what complex quantity you're given, if you want to compute its magnitude, simply take the complex quantity multiply it by its conjugate, and then take the square root. And this quantity is a real valued quantity. Okay, now that we've reviewed some basics about frequency and some basics about complex numbers, let's go ahead and spend a few minutes reviewing some transforms that you're already familiar with. The first one that we'll talk about is the Fourier series. We use the Fourier series to compute the frequency domain representation of periodic signals. So anytime we start talking about computing the Fourier series, we're inherently talking about a signal that is periodic with some period. So we're going to use, as usual, the notation capital T to indicate its period in time domain, how, frequency, how often it repeats in time. If it has a period T, then we know that its fundamental frequency in terms of radial units is omega naught. So omega naught is 2 pi over T. And this right here is the Fourier series representation of the signal. These components right here, capital X of K, these are what are known as the Fourier series coefficients of the signal.
Some textbooks like to use the notation x sub k, but that's just a notation thing. This right here, these are the Fourier series coefficients of the signal x of t. Be careful with the notation. This is a capital X. Sometimes we use little x of k to denote a discrete time signal, right? So be careful. This is a very different quantity. Capital X of k, those are Fourier series coefficients, and they represent the frequency content of the signal x of t. For instance, in this summation, the k equals 0 term, so the k equals 0 term would have an x of 0. Capital X of 0, the Fourier series coefficient for k equals 0, this represents the DC content of the signal. Similarly, at capital X of 1, this tells us how much of frequency omega naught is present in the signal. Capital X of 2 tells us how much frequency content at 2 omega naught the signal X of t has, and so on. So by being able to write down a time domain signal X of t in this format, the Fourier series coefficients tell us how much of each frequency 0 omega naught, 2 omega naught, 3 omega naught, etc. the signal has. So this is something we're, we're used to doing. We've learned how to compute the Fourier series coefficients previously. Once we have those, we know we can write down the signal x of t in this form, and we call this the Fourier series. In this class, we're going to study something very similar. The difference is we're not going to be finding the Fourier series representation of x of t. We're going to be finding the Fourier series representation of the discrete time signal x of k. When we compute the Fourier series representation of the discrete time and periodic signal x of k, we are going to call it the discrete time Fourier series. So previously we have learned how to compute the Fourier series of a signal. In this class we are going to learn how to compute the discrete time Fourier series of a signal. We now turn our attention to the Fourier transform. We use the Fourier transform to find the frequency domain representation of non-periodic signals, x of t. So if we're dealing with a continuous time signal x of t that's not periodic, we can compute the Fourier transform of the signal using this equation. So these equations right here are very, very similar. This is capital X of omega. This is capital X of f. Both of these are the Fourier transform of the time domain signal x of t. One just uses radial frequencies, and one uses linear frequencies. I tend to use this one a little bit more when I write things down, but uh, they're totally equivalent. So the Fourier transform, x of f, is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity, x of t e to the minus j 2 pi f t dt. This is the Fourier transform of the signal x of t. And again, this is something that you spend a lot of time working with in previous classes how to compute it both from this formal definition of the Fourier transform and also once you got good at that by using Fourier transform tables. You can be given a signal x of t and you can go look up in a table or use properties of Fourier transform to figure out what x of f or equivalently x of omega was. We're going to do something very similar in this class for discrete time signals. If I'm working with the discrete time signal x of k that is non-periodic, then I can compute the discrete time Fourier transform of the signal. So we now have kind of two new transforms that we've mentioned, the discrete time Fourier series, which is what we'll use to compute the frequency domain representation of periodic discrete time signals and also the discrete time Fourier transform, which we'll use to compute the frequency domain representation of non-periodic discrete time signals. Finally, let's talk about the Laplace transform. So again, the Laplace transform is something we use to analyze continuous time signals x of t, and the definition of the Laplace transform was this equation right here x of s, so x of s is the Laplace transform of x of t, is equal to this integral expression right here. s is equal to sigma plus j omega. And by looking at this equation, we can see that the Laplace transform is really just a more general transform than the Fourier transform. 
Specifically, if sigma is equal to zero, then s is just equal to j omega. So just plug sigma equals zero in here, and we see that s is equal to j omega. Then this integral reduces to this. The integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of t e to the minus j omega dt. But now what is this right here? That is simply the Fourier transform of the signal x of omega. So as a special case of the Laplace transform, that special case being the case when we set sigma equals to zero, we actually get the Fourier transform out of this equation. So the Laplace transform is this general transform that's good for any sigmas and omegas such that this integral converges. If the set of s's happens to contain the set of points sigma equals zero, then what we can actually do is actually get out the Fourier transform of the signal. So the Laplace transform is a, is a general transform and out of it kind of pops the Fourier transform. We're going to have something similar in this class. We're going to have a, another transform, a more general transform, and this transform is called the Z transform. Just like the Laplace transform is more general than the Fourier transform, and from the Laplace transform we can actually obtain the Fourier transform, same thing is going to happen for the Z transform. The Z transform is a more general transform than the discrete time Fourier transform, and we can actually get the discrete time Fourier transform from the Z transform by evaluating the Z transform at a set certain point in the complex plane. So the Z transform is a very general transform we'll be studying, and it's completely analogous to the continuous time Laplace transform. Except obviously the Z transform is for discrete time signals that we're studying in this course.